So we could start the story of this book when you texted me to ask me if we could talk. And I thought you wanted to continue our ongoing conversation about wallpaper and landscaping. But what came before that? When did you get the idea for this book? When did it come to you? It was after we did Share the Mic on social media in the summer of 2020. There had been this intense public unrest happening in the country after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were murdered. In private, I was having these really heartfelt conversations with Black folks who were just struggling. Like, I can't watch any more of this. I can't take this anymore. I cannot. And in public, the conversation was, how can we get white people to be better? How can we get white people to be anti-racist? Anti-racism became the order of the day, but there was no focus on Black humanity. I kept thinking, where's the space for us to talk about what this does to us, how this affects our lives? And so I was thinking to myself that I really wanted to have a conversation with you. At first, I struggled to text you. I kept asking myself, why am I hesitating to reach out to her? We have a close enough friendship to talk about anything. Your work is so important to me and my experience as a human being. But as a Black woman, I often felt like I had to contort myself to fit into the work and see myself in it. I wanted to talk to you about adding to it. What is the Black experience with shame resilience? Because white supremacy has added another layer to the kind of shame we have to deal with and the kind of resilience we have to build and the kind of vulnerability that we are constantly subjected to, whether we choose it or not. So, yeah, I called and I said all of that, but I was not as eloquent (laughs) at the time. I will never forget that phone call. I texted, can we talk? And you texted back, sure. And once we got on the phone, I shared the idea. The first thing you said was, oh, hell yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I want to talk about that. Yes. I want to do this. At that point, I was just thinking, oh, and here I was worrying about offending you and wanting to have a real conversation. So that was the beginning from my side. What was happening on your side? From my side, admittedly, I'd probably do anything you asked me to do. But the timing was bigger than us. I had really been grappling over the last couple of years with trying to figure out how to be more inclusive, how to present the work in a way that invited more people to see themselves. You know, the last thing I ever wanted to do was put work in the world around shame, vulnerability, and courage, then make people feel like they had to do something extra to find themselves in it. You know, I thought I had control for that with my sample because I've always been hyper vigilant about diversity in the people I interview and in the data sources. In fact, one of the earliest criticisms of my work was that the sample population actually over indexed around Black women and Latinx folks. But I started to get comments, um, especially from Black women and men. Comments like, you know, I'm having to work at this more to see myself in it, more than I would have preferred or more than I would have liked to have to do. Finally, it was the combination of a conversation with you and a conversation with Austin Channing Brown on her TV show where I thought the problem isn't the research. The research resonates with a diverse group of people because it's based on a diverse sample. But the way I present my research to the world does not always resonate because I often use myself and my stories as examples. And I have a very privileged white experience. That was a huge aha for me. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, one of the things that struck me was in The Gifts of Imperfection, there's a scene where I'm in sweats and I have dirty hair and I'm running up the Nordstrom escalator with my daughter to exchange some shoes that her grandmother bought her. Immediately, I'm overwhelmed because I look and feel like shit and there's all these perfect looking people giving me the side eye. And just as I start to go into shame, a pop song starts playing and Ellen breaks out into the robot. And I mean, full on, unfiltered, unaware, just sheer joy. And as the perfect people start staring at her, I'm reduced to this moment where I have to decide, am I going to betray her and roll my eyes and say, you know, Ellen, geez, settle down. Or am I going to just let her do her thing and be joyful and unashamed? You know, I end up choosing her and actually dancing with her. And it's a, it's a great story about choosing my daughter over acceptance by strangers. 
But I've shopped enough with black friends to know that if I was not dressed up, even if I, even if I was dressed up and I was in a department store where my black daughter broke into a dance, there would be a whole other set of variables to consider, including being hassled by security, possibly separated from my daughter, even arrested. So when you asked me if we could focus the work through the lens of the Black experience, it was a hell yes for me. I want to figure out how to better serve. 